Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. God has spent a great deal of time teaching us about worship. Not just how to worship, but the various elements that for tabernacle worship and then temple worship after that, they were necessary. Today, we have no tabernacle. There is no temple. And for the body of believers, if that temple is rebuilt in your days, it will not be of a spiritual relevance for you for worship. Why do I say that? Because the temple that will be rebuilt in the last days will be for the purpose of the Antichrist. And I am quite confident that what will go on there will not be pleasing to God. And therefore, our worship that we are called to do today, tomorrow, and until our blessed hope the rapture happens is a worship in spirit, led by the spirit, rooted in the truth of God as Messiah taught in John chapter 4. How we come together not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, whether there's two or three or five or ten or whatever large group, we come together, and it's so important that we do so for the right reason, to bring honor and glory to Him. Worship is never, and I want to emphasize that, worship is never about me receiving. Worship is about me giving and giving unto the Lord not appearing before him empty-handed. And therefore we come, some bring a psalm to share, some with a song or a spiritual melody, others with a, a word. And we come together under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, pursuing God's presence, doing things, being led by the Spirit under the authority of His Word. And we learn principles from the tabernacle worship that we can utilize even today in order that God is glorified. He is the one that worship is offered up to. He is the one that is at the forefront. And whenever worship focuses on man, it becomes idolatry. And that's why I'm so concerned today that many of the songs that are being offered up as worship are more in regard to humanity. What God does for me. There's a, a false teacher, and, and I believe that he is very dangerous. And he has recently come out and he says, well, one can be justified by faith, but in order to enter into the kingdom of God, you have to have works. Here's the problem. Justification brings about a kingdom experience. And that justification is by faith alone, not based upon some works. Now, I want to share with you and an illustration, and why, why that type of teaching emphasizing works as necessity for entrance into the kingdom of God is a heresy, and it is no other than a works-based righteousness. Now, we need to have the mind of God based upon the illumination of Scripture so we hear correctly. 
Are works important for the believer? Absolutely. Does true faith manifest works? Absolutely. But are those works in any way necessary for salvation, for entrance into the kingdom of God? They are not. Let me give an example of this. Losing weight. Now, when you step on the scale and you've lost weight, that scale reflects that. But stepping on the scale does not cause you to lose weight. It only measures what you have done. It's these other things, dieting, exercise, and so forth, that causes the loss of weight in that same way. What causes me to be redeemed is the blood of Messiah. And when I have faith in his work, what he did upon that cross, the shedding of his blood, knowing who he is, that he is the only begotten son of God, that he is God among us. When I respond to the gospel by faith, I am saved. Works do not maintain my salvation. Works do not play any role in justification or my salvation experience. When it says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, what it speaks of is that salvation works out. There is an outcome from it, but it's an outcome. It is not the cause. It's evidence in the same way, going back to our foolish example, in the same way that stepping on that scale and seeing, oh, I've lost two kilos. That has nothing to do. That scale doesn't cause it. It simply confirms what was done. And in that same way, works. They do not play any role in justification in salvation works do not get us into the kingdom of God what does works show that we are redeemed and we become by grace through faith through what he's done we become a, a kingdom creation we become part of that kingdom work simply gives evidence of what he has done and that's why more and more, and remember, we are told in the last days, there's going to be apostasy. It's going to become greater, more prevalent, more numerous. And we see little by little, growing in speed and frequency, people who once taught that which was good, they're changing. And that's why it's so important that we base everything, and I want to emphasize that, everything upon the Word of God. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Exodus and chapter 38. Now, we're going to study primarily three things in this lesson. We're going to begin with the altar we spoke about the incense altar. This is the primary altar, the one for burnt offerings, that bronze or copper or brass, however this word, nechoshet, your Bible translates it, some copper, some brass, some bronze, but it's the same Hebrew word. So this brazen altar then we're going to move on and speak about the kior, which is the, the basin. Some, I believe, call it a laver. It's the place where the priest would wash in order to, in order to prepare for service. So we see that, and then we also are going to conclude with the, the study of the courtyard and how it was made. Now, all of these things we've studied before in Exodus, some more than once. But each time, we're getting a new, a, a, a fuller perspective. 
And things are written in a manner in order to give us greater revelation so that we can understand the details of worshiping God. Let's begin. Chapter 38, as I said, verse 1. And he made the, the burnt offering altar. And he made it from, it's a shittim. This is acacia wood. And its length was five cubits, and five cubits was its width. And then we have that word rabua, although here it's ravua, and this means a square. So the altar for the burnt offerings outside the, the tabernacle building, that holy place in the most holy place, it was outside in the courtyard. And it was made, as we see here, of acacia wood. And we find as well that its height was three cubics in, in height. Verse 2. You make horns in the altar in the four corners would have horns that would come up. So he says, and he made its horns upon the four corners. And then we see expression, mimenu hayu, which means this, that it was made part of this altar. The horns were not attached later on, but it came from the same wood, the same piece of wood that made the, the area that it was upon. It was one piece. This is what it means, memenu hayu. So from it were the, the horns of it, and it was covered. He covered it with, as well, this whole altar. He covered it with nehoshe whether it's bronze or copper or brass, however your Bible translates it. Verse 3, And he made all the vessels of the altar, and we have the, the pans, and then the shovels. This is to gather up the, the ashes. Also, it's basins. These basins would be for, for gathering blood. And also in order to move and adjust the, the sacrifice, also Ms. Lagot. Now, Ms. Leg in the singular, in modern Hebrew, is a fork. So these would be these forks in order to transport and adjust the positioning of the sacrifice. And also, Machtot, these would be, some Bibles may say fire pans or censers, this is for dealing, putting out the fire of the altar. So all of these things, all the vessels he made once more of this uh, this, this copper, this, this brass. Verse 4. In addition to what we've seen also related to this altar, he made for the altar what's called a mikbar. And this would be like a, a mesh grating. And this would be for the purpose of, of placing the, the sacrifice upon it in order that uh, the fire could come up and, and make it what it is, the altar of the burnt offerings. So you had this grating. It was the work of a type of of netting that was also of bronze or brass or copper, and it was underneath the rim, the rim of the altar. From the bottom, ad chetzio, that is, from the very bottom, it was halfway up. So this is because on the top half is where the offering, the sacrifice, would, would be laid and consume that space. Verse, verse 5. And he cast four rings on the four sides of this, this uh, mesh netting of, of copper as well or brass or bronze. And these were for houses for the poles. 
Now, almost all the elements, whether we're talking about the Ark of the Covenant or the table of showbread or the incense altar, they had these rings that were placed upon the sides and they would make poles, badim, and they would cover these poles frequently in gold, but here we're going to see something different in order for the transporting of the, the altar. And this all had to do from going from one place to another. And again, I said this earlier, but I want to reinforce. Worship continuously replaces us, repositions us where God wants us to be. And if you're not worshiping properly, you are going to have a spiritually stagnant life. And I believe that describes a lot of believers today. And that spiritual stagnant life brings about frustration. It brings about discouragement because there's not going to be that anointing and there's not going to be an accomplishment of the purposes of God. And therefore, that relationship with God is going to grow cold. It is not going to have the excitement, the joy that, that it should. So he says in verse 5, and he cast four rings on the four sides of this mesh netting of, of bronze. And there was also these houses, these places where the poles would go through, verse 6. And he made the poles of, once again, acacia wood, et shittim. And he covered them, not like he did with the, the Ark of the Covenant or the table of showbread or something else. He covered it, not with gold, but once more, nehoshek, this, this bronze, verse 7. And he brought the poles into the rings upon the sides of this altar. And then we have that expression so frequently read, let's set oto behem, in order to carry it with them, with them, with the poles, carry it, this, this altar for the burnt offering. And the, this altar was made of acacia wood. Its planks were hollow and he made them. Now, all of these things have revelation. Why were the planks here hollow? Why are things made this way? This is what you need to read over and over and seek God's face by means of the Holy Spirit for greater insight. What we're doing is just touching the surface. It is a, a preliminary experience for further worship. Let's move on to verse 8. And the second object, the second instrument or vessel of the kior, the basin. Verse 8. And he made the kior, this basin, also nechoshek. So it was a copper or brass or bronze basin. And its, its base was also copper. It says, with mirrors of the working woman who served at the entrance of the tent of the meeting. Now, I found this very significant. That this basin, and I don't recall this being told to us earlier, could be wrong. But it's interesting that the basin was made, and it tells us it was a bronze or brass or copper, but it also had, your Bibles may say, looking glass or mirrors. It's the word ma'ot, ma'ot, mirrors. And this would have allowed that there would be some type of a visual reflection in this this basin in order that the people could see themselves and it's significant that the women who serve they contributed this these mirrors verse 9 9 beginning in that verse we move into the final section 
having to do with the chatzer, that is the courtyard. Now, we know something. We know that the mizbeach, this altar that we spoke of for the burnt offering, and the basin, the kior, it was in the courtyard. So we have the tabernacle structure outside, the altar for the burnt offerings, and the, the laver or the basin for washing of the, the priests, their hands and their feet. And now we're going to finish the structure because here's something that's so important, another principle of worship. And this is something that, that many people struggle with because we like the word freedom, liberty. But more often than not, people do not understand the truth about this freedom and liberty that God gives. It's a freedom and liberty to submit to God. It's being delivered, set free from the influence of sin so you can submit to God. It is not a freedom and liberty that justifies what you want. That takes you right back to bondage to sin. And again, I'll say, all too often, the worship represents a perverted understanding of liberty and freedom. The tabernacle had a a border. There was, in Hebrew, we would call it a misgeret, a framework, a border. And the work of the priests were done in this, this courtyard And also the tabernacle itself was in the courtyard. So there was a specific place for worship. And you could not do these things outside of that location. And that's why we read, let's move to this third and final section, beginning with verse 9. He made the courtyard. And then he speaks about the southern side. The southern side, it had hangings of the courtyard. These would be the the curtains or hangings that were on pillars. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But notice what it says. On the southern side, there were these hangings for the courtyard. And they were made, shouldn't surprise us, of this fine twisted linen. And the, the length of that side, it says here, mea ba'ama, 100 cubics. Now we're going to get some additional details about this. In order to hang these hangings, there had to be a place for that. And therefore, there were, look at verse 10, for the courtyard, there was their pillars. How many were there? There were 20. And there was also not only 20 pillars, but 20 sockets. And we find that the sockets, as well as the pillars, they were of, as well, copper, bronze, or brass. And upon these pillars, there were hooks, the hooks of the pillars, and also the bands. They were of a different material. They were of silver. That concludes the instruction for that that southern side. Now look at verse 11. In verse 11, we talk about the, the northern side. It was also 100 cubits. It also had, as it says here, 20 pillars and 20 sockets. This is what the pillars were placed in to bring stability. There were also 20 sockets. And likewise... The hooks of the pillars and the the bands, once more, which is what we learned for the southern side, the northern side also had these, these hooks and these bands, and they were made of silver. Verse 12. So we've dealt with the two longer sides, the southern and the northern. Now, and we already know this from our studying, the other sides are going to be smaller. Look now to verse verse 12. We read here, 
and the western side. This faced the, the sea, the Mediterranean Sea. The western side, it had its hanes as well, but we find that it had 50. 50 cubics was this side with its hangings. And the pillars, notice the pillars were, were 10, and also the sockets were 10. The hooks of these pillars and their bands, once more, similarly like the other two sides, they were silver. So the only difference here is when we look at the, the western side, we find that, that the, the length was 50, and I hope I said this right the first time, 50 cubics. And then there was 10, 10 pillars and 10 sockets. Now go to verse 13. In regard to the eastern side, now the eastern side is going to be the most unusual because it's going to be divided into three sections. I want to say that again. This, this eastern side has three sections. There is going to be a partial side, then a gate, and that gate will consist of a screen. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And then the other side. And it's going to be divided into three sections, this, this eastern side, where the entrance was, where the gate of the courtyard was. So let's read this carefully. Look now at verse 13. And the eastern side... There were, just like the western side, 50 cubics. The hangings, there were 15 cubics. So we look here and we see a little bit of a difference. Because they're both 50, but earlier on when we looked at the western side, we saw that it was 50 cubics, but when we look at the, the, the instructions, we see that there were 50 cubics that side, but when we look at the pillars, there were 10. Now, when we look at the eastern side, we see that the hangings, there were how long? 15 for one shoulder. Now, remember I said, this side is going to consist of three different sections. There's going to be one, what the scripture calls one shoulder, then the second shoulder, and in between them is going to be the gate. So it's going to be broken up. These measurements are going to be broken up. So the eastern side is 50 cubics. It has its hangings, and there's 15 cubics on one shoulder. And we find that their pillars are going to be three. Their sockets are going to be three. Then when we look at the second shoulder, it is going to be, it says, mise mise, which is like the other shoulder. It is going to be for the gate of the courtyard. It likewise, this other shoulder is going to have 15 hangings, and there's going to be three pillars and three sockets. Now we're ready for something very important. Look now to verse 16. All the hangings of the courtyard are round. They were this fine twisted linen, and we find that its, its sockets for the pillars were, were copper or bronze or brass. The hooks of the pillars and its bands were silver. And the heads, the very top, were covered with silver. And they, all these pillars of the courtyard, they were, their bands were silver. Verse 18. Now, he tells us a little bit about all these hangings, nature of the pillars, the sockets, the bands, the tops, everything. And then he goes to this gate. And what does he say about this? Look at verse 18. And the screen of the gate of the courtyard. That means the gate was like a screen. It was the work of embroidery. And it was made of these 
elements that we've seen throughout our study of the tabernacle. It was made of this unique blue techelet and this royal purple argaman, tola'at shani, that is that, that scarlet, and also, once again, this fine, twisted linen. But notice what it says. 20 cubics was its length. Now, remember, the total of this side, the eastern side, is just like the western side. How many? 50. The southern side, the northern side, 100. The western side, 50. And the eastern side, which has this entrance, this gate, this screen that made the gate, it was 50. And it's going to be divided up. Look again at what it says. Look, if you would, to verse 20. Excuse me, verse 18, the second part. It says, and 20 cubits its length, and its height and its breadth was five cubits, corresponding to the hangings of the courtyard. Verse 19. Their pillars were four, and their sockets were four. And once again, the whole thing, Nehoshik, bronze or copper or brass. Their hooks were silver covered. That is, their heads were covered and their bands were silver. And what we have here is this. If you look very carefully, it's 50. But it's made up, the center portion is 20. The two shoulders are 15 each. So 15 and 15 is 30. The middle portion where the gate is, that screen, is 20. So 20, 15, and 15 is 50. And then you look very carefully at what it says here. You find that the pillars for this middle portion are four. And then you have three on one shoulder, three on the other, four total of 10. And this is unique, and it speaks to how God sees every aspect of worship unique. And he brings them together into something that is pleasing to him. Now, I can use a word, but we need to be very careful about it. Because the word that could be used is the word beautiful. But here's the problem. We hear beautiful, and more often than not, it's a very subjective term, what I think is beautiful. But the word here could be the Hebrew word yafe. And yafe means pretty or beautiful, but it has, in the biblical sense, another element that makes it pretty or beautiful, and that is its appropriateness. So never, never think, because I think it's pretty, I think it's right, I think it's proper. We have liberty and freedom to do what we want. Those are lies of the enemy, distortions of Satan. We need to always come before him submissively with a desire to obey and please him, offering, doing what he has commanded in the way. And it's only when we submit then and only then is there unity. And this is why I want to go back and say something very important about, about leadership. Many people, when it comes to divisive issues, such as politics, they, in order to preserve unity, they, they make compromise. And they say, God forbidden statements. That is, you know, we, we're free in Messiah to make these decisions. No, we're not. We're always obligated to submit to his choices, not ours. Doesn't matter what we think, what we like, what we think is beautiful or not. We are called to submit. And it's only, and hear this, and this to me is so basic, but... It's overlooked, overlooked by people such as Andy Stanley, David Platt, John Piper, those individuals 
that, that even question the necessity for a believer to vote because maybe there's not a, a, a holy enough individual. Let me share with you something. It is only when, when truth is embraced and submitted to, when people obey the truth of God, that produces unity. When we compromise truth in order to preserve a, a manly, a human understanding of unity, what that is, is inviting the enemy. It is inviting demonic influence. Now, I choose my words. I try to very carefully, and I did so here. When we set aside God's truth in order to preserve a human understanding of unity, it is an invitation for demonic influence. And the problem today is that there are leaders who do not understand biblical liberty, the freedom that the Word of God speaks to, and how it is a stench in the nostrils of God for us to compromise what God instructs us. Never, never compromise the Word of God. To do so once more is to invite the enemy into your midst. When we look at tabernacle worship, it is most specific. They couldn't change and said, well, instead of, of 10 pillars, we're going to put in 12. Or instead of how many sockets, we'll just, we'll just do it this way. Absolutely not. That would make worship an inability. It would make it not godly worship, but it would corrupt it. We should strive, we should be praying that our worship is not corrupted by our own thoughts, but rather it is a worship that's pleasing to God because we have heard His instructions, we have kept those instructions, we've applied it for one purpose, that God might be pleased. And when God is pleased with our obedience, the outcome of that will be a moving of the Holy Spirit and anointing in our life so that we can move up to a greater spiritual le level to do more of the things that are pleasing to God. Well, I'll close with that. Until next week, Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.